so uh, good evening to all of you and a very warm welcome to the third talk series ai and beyond this talk series is organized by the school of artificial intelligence and data science aide in collaboration with jodhpur city knowledge and innovation foundation the school of aid is a young school that aims to conduct world class research in both fundamental and applied areas of artificial intelligence and data science towards that goal the school is proud to bring to you the fourth talk of the thar talk series let me uh, briefly introduce our panel members uh, professor shantanu choudhury he is currently the director of iit jodhpur professor choudhury holds a btech degree in electronics and electrical communication engineering and phd in computer science engineering from iit kharagpur professor choudhury is a fellow of indian national academy of engineers and national academy of sciences he is a fellow of international association of pattern recognition uh, he was awarded the indian national science academy medal for young scientist in 1993 he has also received the accs cdac award for his research contribution in the year 2012 professor choudhury has about 300 publications in peer reviewed journals and conference proceedings to his credit uh, dr sampaj rath wadera he is the head of the department of physics at iit jodhpur with a phd in physics from jnaran vyas university he was the director at the defense lab of defense research and development organization he has nearly 35 years of experience of translation r&d before he joined iit jodhpur his areas of interest include solid state physics nano science and nano technology stealth materials and stealth technology uh, next we have dr g s tokeja who is the chief executive officer of the jodhpur city knowledge and innovation foundation which has been established under the principal scientific advisor government of india with iit jodhpur as the nodal agency dr tuteja has served as director dmrc jodhpur a respected scientist and a renowned researcher dr tuteja has led multiple teams and has held key positions at icmr we have dr ranju mohan who is an assistant professor in the department of civil and infrastructure engineering at iit jodhpur she obtained her phd from iit madras and her areas of interest include traffic flow theory macroscopic and microscopic modeling of traffic flow connected and autonomous vehicles and also dynamic traffic assignment i now invite uh, dr ranju to introduce our speaker for the day over to you dr ranju uh, thank you dr rajendra and uh, very good evening all so we have today with us professor shrinivas pita professor shrinivas pita is the frederick articles chair and professor in the school of civil and environmental engineering and the h milton stewart school of industrial and systems engineering at georgia institute of technology he is also principal research faculty at the georgia tech research institute prior to that up to 2018 he was the jack and k hopema professor in civil and Eng civil engineering at purdue university and the director of the nextran center formerly the us department of transportation federal region fi university transportation center he was also the associate director of us dot center for connected and automated transportation he served as chair from 2007 to 13 of the committee on transportation network modeling of the transportation research board trb of the us national academies he serves or has served on multiple trb committees he is also a member of international federation of automatic control technical committee on transportation systems in 2016 he served as transportation expert on behalf of the us department of state in support of india's smart cities mission in 2018 he was special guest and distinguished participant at the government of india's move a global mobility summit he is the 2019 recipient of the distinguished alumnus award from the indian institute of technology madras 
has authored over 360 peer review publications and received over $48 million in research funding. Some of his recognitions include the Informs Transportation Science Best Dissertation Award, 1994, US NSF Career Award in 1997, Purdue C for Success Award from 2007 to 13, TRB Blue uh, Ribbon Committee Award in 2013, AC Walter Huber Research Prize in 2009, UNICE Distinguished Researcher Award 2010, IIT Distinguished Alumnus Award 2019, and several paper awards from conferences such as AC, IE, TRB, and other journals. Several of his students have received best dissertation of thesis awards from professional organizations such as CUTC, IUTBR, and COTA. He serves as associate or area editor for two journals and is on the editorial advisory boards of several journals. His research interests are multidisciplinary and broadly span transportation and infrastructure system. And uh, we are very lucky to have him today for the fourth talk of this TAR talk series. And uh, I warmly welcome uh, Professor Pita for his talk, and he will deliver a talk on psychological and cognitive aspects of real time information systems and their impacts on driver performance and decision making. Welcome to uh, uh, the talk, Professor Pita, and over to you. Thank you, Ranjiro. So it's a pleasure to be at uh, IIT Jodhpur, and uh, I just uh, before I start out, I just wanted to mention that uh, Ranju was at uh, the Next Trans Center when I was at Purdue University when she was doing her PhD with uh, Professor Gita Krishnan from IIT Madras, who I see is also on the uh, list of attendees today. So it's uh, nice to make that connection again. Today's presentation is uh, looking at a, one of the directions of research that uh, I work on. And it is broadly in the context of real time information systems. And what I'll be talking about today, first, I'll start with the high level problem and how it relates to the real world. And then I'll try to go as much as possible into uh, the specifics of what we did uh, as part of uh, two studies related to that. And uh, depending on the time we have, I'll try to cover the details. But primarily, I want to provide a set of takeaway messages related to the role of the cognitive and, and psychological aspects of uh, real-time information on how it affects driver actions and their decision making. I noticed that in the thought series, the first three uh, re uh, talks related to the brain, and uh, this one would be possibly a transition one where they're looking at how we measure brain activity in the context of an application domain, and that is related to how drivers and travelers make uh, decisions in the context of information being provided to them. So, let's see how I can get to the next slide. Okay. There you go. Okay, so now it's moving. I'm sorry, I said problems here. So I want to first introduce the Autonomous and Connected Transportation Lab at Georgia Tech, primarily to illustrate the resources that we leverage in order to be able to derive insights on the problem that we're addressing. So this is the address of the Autonomous and Connected Transportation Lab or the ACT Lab at Georgia Tech, which has a full cab driving simulator and two desktop simulators uh, I'll actually be showing a two minute video next that will kind of illustrate what's going on just to again provide the context related to this. And what it does is it provides an immersive traffic environment in the sense of how drivers interact with their environment when they're driving. And related to that, we're able to collect behavior data for drivers or travelers, as well as vehicle dynamics and so on, because uh, the vehicle has movements as well. And it can even interact with things like potholes. So there are or even weather conditions where conditions are slick due to ice and so on. So all of these can be accounted for in there. Uh, very importantly, uh, we do have physiological sensors, which are important in the context of getting the physiological data, because this data from the human directly. And in that context, we use uh, EEG from the brain, ECG associated uh, with measurements of the heart, 
eye tracking ability to track how or where users are looking at, whether they're looking at within the vehicle or they're looking at outside and you know, from that to infer on things. And then facial recognition, because that allows us to uh, also address things related to fatigue and distraction and so on. And this is what you see here. You see a EEG on the top, then you see a ECG, then you see the cameras associated with the smart eye, eye tracking system, which is a non-intrusive one. The last one you see here is a VR uh, uh, device that we have, virtual reality device. Very importantly, our driving simulator is integrated in real time with a traffic flow simulator that required efforts from our research group at uh, the ACT Lab. And this is important because we can generate scenarios in the traffic simulator and have the participant in the driving simulator face the exact same situation. So in many ways, we can control the scenarios associated with what we see in the real world related to traffic. There are multiple vehicle environments uh, in this context. We can have HDV or human-driven vehicles, autonomous vehicles, connected vehicles, connected autonomous vehicles, electric vehicles, or mixed flows, which are combinations of these. And we can look at multiple travel modes. Uh, when I say auto here, I mean uh, personal automobile, it's not auto rickshaw here, transit, pedestrian, bicycles, ride sharing, and so on. And we can illustrate infrastructure on the road, the weather conditions, and uh, the technological infrastructure, and so on. So what I illustrate here next is what is uh, this center in terms of what we do in, uh, in getting the data? And also, what is the intent of it? So please bear with me for a couple of minutes as we see this uh, video. Excuse me, Professor Peter. Uh, I think now the sound is not coming. So this lab seeks to understand how okay. drivers are uh, interacting with uh, different types of capabilities. We have all kinds of uh, elements, and uh, you know, so we have Bluetooth, we have uh, music, you have information that they get in real time. You have a GPS systems. So all of that information that humans will are likely interact with in the future while they're multitasking in a driving environment is the kind of uh, research that we want to explore to see what are the uh, factors that enable us to have humans do that as safely as possible without distraction and in the most convenient uh, manner possible to that. So whatever uh, is shown on the projectors and what the driver sees can be controlled from this setup here. Uh, this is the host computer. This is what connects everything uh, from the center channels, which project the uh, images to how data is collected and also uh, integration with other two simulators in that room. The humans, the vehicles and the infrastructure interact continuously. So if you change the vehicle technologies as is happening right now, where we get into uh, different levels of automation and with connectivity, that changes the way the humans in the vehicle will interact uh, with the vehicle itself. All right, the intent of that was to illustrate the resource that we are using and why and how we plan to use it. We saw some of the members of uh, the ACT uh, lab there. And in the context of this study, we'll be collecting detailed data using uh, electroencephalogram. And this is an example of an electroencephalogram where the driver is wearing it. And from based on that, if you look at the right corner here, you'll see a bunch of nodes from which there are waves that are being captured. And then these are our signals that are being captured. Then these signals are trans uh, transferred into the uh, band powers using fast Fourier uh, transforms. So I wanted to illustrate the setup uh, and how it is used, but the experiments that I'm going to talk about today were conducted at Purdue University, and I'll be illustrating the setup that's out there, but the general conceptual overview is still the same. 
So when we look at uh, real time information systems, there are uh, what I can remember three decades ago from the late 1980s to the early 1990s when people talked about advanced traveler information systems. Uh, the intent was for drivers or travelers to receive information in real time that will allow them to make more informed decisions related to their travel. So that was at the simplest level. But given the technology at that time, it was mostly implied as an in-vehicle device and roadside beacons with which information would be exchanged, and that's how people would have access to technology and uh, the information. And since then, for the past three decades, there have been substantial uh, advancements in various dimensions of technology, not the least of which is information and communication technologies. And what we are seeing and what I'm going to illustrate right now is that there is multiple dimensions associated with information that uh, and uh, the sources, the type of information, the technologies that are involved that substantially differ from the original uh, expectation of what advanced traveler information systems would be. And with this, we can have within the vehicle personal devices or in vehicle devices to receive information. Here you see a Tesla with a uh, device, a dashboard panel that allows us to get information. And what we'll be seeing going forward into the future, which is augmented reality with uh, uh, heads up display, uh, more and more we'll be seeing that as well in terms of the ability to interact. All of these illustrate again the same fundamental point the need for the driver or the traveler to interact or interface with information in real time. And outside the vehicle, there are variable or dynamic message signs in the traffic context or travel context, which provide information, uh, which is more generic. We can have uh, smart devices. So here you see a speed uh, dynamic speed uh, sign there. So we'll be seeing, and these are just some of those. And then we'll have virtual information that's being transmitted within the vehicle. So going forward, when we have uh, signalless intersections and so on. And in terms of the technology, we have connected vehicles which provide uh, information related to actions that potentially the traveler or driver has to make, and also autonomous vehicles where the individual is interacting with a, a whole uh, range of uh, situations in an in-vehicle environment where the vehicle is making decisions for itself related to travel based on how it perceives the outside environment. So what we see here today is a substantial expansion or advancement in the type of technologies and the type of uh, capabilities related to how information uh, uh, is available to the human and how the human has to interact with the vehicle and the infrastructure in order to make travel related decisions. And part of it, when we get to autonomous vehicles and so on, even relates to other activities uh, beyond travel that an individual will conduct within the vehicle, for example, related to work, related to leisure. So that leads to other types of uh, uh, in interesting interactions in terms of what it is that is needed in the context of real-time information. Of course, in terms of the benefits, being able to have more informed uh, uh, travel decisions always is helpful because uh, that allows the driver to have better situational awareness. Uh, providing information in real time for safety critical situations like collision warnings or sudden uh, breaking of a vehicle downstream. All of these can be potentially important. We can notify vehicle status uh, in, a, in terms, the traditional one that we are used to is looking at the fuel status and so on. We go way beyond that, that is possible. Here you see a Model X from Tesla and some of the information that you can see there, but this is just an indicator for the type of information or the types of information one can get in the context of the vehicle when driving itself. And so there are fundamental implications for road safety through actions that drivers make or take. And then in terms of the performance of traffic networks in terms of the route choices that people make. I'm going to connect these two, which is why we're emphasizing these aspects. There are many more aspects that one can address, but these are the ones that I'll be covering in this talk. So what you see right now, based on the what I provided earlier, is that people may have or will have access to a lot of information. So what you see in the panel today there, you can see lots of information that people have to interact with in real time. And this information can be diverse or more diverse than what it is today 
more than traffic information. You can have weather, you can have infotainment. So uh, you can have information related to navigation, audio, video, and haptic. So there are multiple sources of uh, uh, the multiple types of our information that you can get. And this information can be obtained through devices in the vehicle, devices outside the vehicle. So you're going to look at the human requiring the ability to interface to the extent possible with multiple sources of information as well. In fact, the experiments that I'm going to illustrate look at outside the vehicle and inside the vehicle as well. And in terms of more modes, and by modes here, I mean the modality of how the information is received. I'm not talking about traffic modes here. I'm talking about you know whether it is uh, visual information, auditory information, or haptic information. And then even there, there are new technologies that are being tried out related to so why do we need to address this problem? There are implications for traffic agencies because traffic agencies, their role is simply not related to collecting information and spewing it out. The question is what information would make the best sense for in the end, the people or the, the customers who matter who are the end users. And these end users are uh, passenger travelers and then you know, freight travelers as well. In a similar way, Vehicle manufacturers have a lot of stake in this as well, because they are the ones associated with how the in-vehicle environment is devised. So how we design the in-vehicle environment now and how we transition to the context where we have full level five automation is all related to how it uh, makes the human machine inter interactions or interface as seamless as possible for the travelers. For the information service providers, their uh, focus is on the content. So how they design the content, content of information can be critical to how useful it is in the real world. And then when you look at uh, the uh, delivery systems, how we design these delivery systems in terms of uh, you know, the modes of delivery, in terms of when to deliver, how to deliver, so how, what are the different ways by which you can do that becomes critical. Why? Because it's the same human being but is now expected in a uh, already multitasking environment to interact with more uh, cues or more stimuli. And this is what can cause distractions for travelers or drivers. So the questions, so I just wanted to just quickly summarize the questions and these represent the two parts of the talk, which I'll talk in a couple of slides. How much information can a driver pro process? And this is related to cognition, related to how they internally process that information, how they have the retrieve memory, and then there are psychological aspects which will come in the next question. Driver attributes, the age, gender, and so on, but also familiarity with uh, processing or ac uh, accessing such information can make a difference. Information characteristics in terms of the amount, complexity of information, and the mode of uh, receiving the information, the role of this environment. Because as I mentioned, human beings are multitasking when they're driving or traveling. And that is part of the fundamental challenge here in terms of how to make it seamless. And situational factors, such for example, time of the day, uh, you know, day or night time, weather conditions, the traffic conditions, whether it's congested or not, all of these make a difference. And so these can have implications for the driver performance. And based on this, there is the next question, how does real-time information affect the decisions that the traveler makes? And here, in addition to cognition, there is also the uh, psychology associated with the anxiety and stress uh, that information can bring in the context of the decision making. So even though uh, we can link the psychology to the cognition side and processing of information, it makes a critical difference potentially for travel decisions that are made. Again, here we have driver attributes, information characteristics, and in the context of information characteristics, the content becomes particularly critical as well as whether the information provided is sufficient or not in the context of the decision making. So, and the role of uh, the environment, but also the characteristics associated with the route and the travel context. For example, why or the, what is the object of travel? The type of route, you know, whether it's freeway, it's arterial route or combination thereof, the performance in terms of the particular route, how well it is in terms of travel time, travel cost, the geometric design or geometric characteristics of the route and so on. And also uh, that then, leads to the decision making of the drive. So the challenges in this context are with the increasing availability and complexity of the information, 
if the information is designed poorly, it can affect uh, driver's cognition psychology. But importantly, driver cognition, the state, or what is the cognitive state of the driver is latent, which means uh, this cannot be observed directly. And the question is, how do we infer on that, which becomes part of the uh, main focus of this study? But the important point that I want to emphasize is what's happened in the past. In the past studies, when people talk about information and the role of information in driver decision making related to travel, that is, if I provide information on different routes, how will they determine the choice of the route going forward? Will they shift from their current route? Will they stick to that current route or they modify their current route? All of these are questions that have been addressed, but there's been one fundamental point in addressing these questions. And that is, there is an assumption that information is available seamlessly because these are all based on analytical models or computer simulation models where there's an assumption that if information is provided, then people are going to access it, they're going to use it, and they're going to process it. And this is the key disconnect from the real world because human beings, because of their limited, uh, because of their cognitive uh, abilities and so on, have the limited ability to process information. And as a consequence, in the context of a complex a multitasking environment, that can have significant impacts on what or whether they even use such information. So in that sense, the past studies do overestimate the abilities of humans. They assume that humans are super far, you know, have super powers that all of this is seamless. But in reality, and interestingly, these days we're trying to provide intelligence to uh, robotics, uh, robots where these are the autonomous systems trying to create human-like elements there, but we are already making assumptions on the human being's uh, ability to process information itself. So that would be the key difference from the perspective of the objectives of these studies. So in the first part of this study, I'll be talking about uh, driver performance. That is, how do we uh, infer or estimate the cognitive effects of drivers? That is internal processing, memory retrieval, and so on, anxiety and stress. Uh, under real-time information provision by using objective measures. These are objective because we are going to use the EEG, which is a representation of direct measurements from the brain. And these are unbiased measurements because they're not inferred, they're not uh, proxy, so uh, they're not based on stated uh, intent and so on. The second part is after understanding this, we come up with a hybrid route choice modeling framework that combines these latent cognitive effects with some other variables that people have addressed in the past, which can be measured directly, such as route characteristics, information characteristics, characteristics of the driver, uh, and the situational factors that I mentioned earlier. And we do that through driving simulator experiments, which measure the brain electric activity patterns using the EET. So in that sense, if you look at what's happened in the literature, it is on the top there in the blue shaded areas. They have on route travel information and how it affects route choice decision. But in reality, there can be effects which are uh, latent. And previously, too, the driver characteristics and other factors have been uh, uh, characterized as well. But it's this part that has not been uh, addressed. So that is the first uh, uh, the intent we'll uh, be addressing in the first part. And we do that by, <coughs> sorry, there's another thing. There are some studies which have done survey-based methods, which is doing a survey after people have experience. So this post-experience, somebody has driven on the current day, at the end of it, you come up with questions and see what people do. But then there are they're subject to multiple bi biases and recollection-related issues because there can be memory bias. Because in the end, the decisions that they take and the outcomes that they have may bias their uh, uh, inability to respond to situation because what memory you have after you take an action related to the information provided is the most direct way to measure things. There are also effects of transience because people keep changing their uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, feelings about uh, our trust with information, sort of all these uh, challenges that show up in the real world if you do survey-based methods which are after the fact. So the driving simulator experiments, we use the following context here. We have two routes 
and we have an origin which is just from the current location the driver is at to a destination which is out there in the right top corner and we have two routes one is a freeway route and a freeway implies a road where there is no impeding of travel unless there is congestion that's created because of too much uh, uh, you know demand or a lot of vehicles that are leading to the slowdown of the vehicles themselves so that's the freeway route. The one in the yellow is an arterial route, which has several intersections. So as you can note here, the arterial route has several intersections. So there are artificial uh, uh, control elements there that lead to stoppage of travel and so on. But also the fact that because it's an arterial with several intersections, there are cross intersections there that lead to a more complex travel environment. This is important. So we wanted to isolate it with a simple context here so that we can understand the cognitive effects. And you see here one and one, that simply implies that we provide personalized information at this location. And corresponding to that, there is an ability to shift between the freeway, which is I-465, I-69, that's the route, to the one which involves 86th Street and Allisonville Road. So in either direction, so this becomes a a uh, decision making point to shift from one of these routes to that. There's a second one here, which is why you see two. And at this circle out here, there is a location where you can make a decision too. So we have a freeway route, we have an arterial route. There are also potential locations for accidents. And then we have variable message signs, which are typically shown only on freeways. So these uh, are there for people who are traveling on the freeway. The other thing I want to mention here is that this study focuses only on the first information and route choice location. Actually, in this design, the second one is very close to the destination. So our focus is on the first one to elicit to elicit the types of insights we can. So in terms of the control variables, there are two sources of information. We have a VMS and personalized information. We have four types of information characteristics. I'll mention that in the next slide. We have descriptive versus prescriptive information. Descriptive simply says travel time. Prescriptive says which route to take, the amount of information, whether it's on the current or current and alternative routes. So that also determines the sufficiency of information. And then whether we have accident or no accident situation. Okay, based on that, there are four uh, travel scenarios here, uh, travel information scenarios. The first one is where no information is provided. So this is the base case that we can easily use to infer on what happens related to the cognitive side as well. Then we have the current route of CT, which simply says the travel time on the current uh, route. And unless things are normal, that may be insufficient information. And part of the reason we want to provide information on alternative route is because there are uh, conditions that may lead us to have better uh, travel experience on an alternative route. So if you provide uh, travel time on current and alternative route, we already see that we provide more information compared to the NI and CT in the AT case. And the prescriptive information which is done when we have accidents is a direct uh, uh, suggestion to the recommendation to the uh, traveler uh, driver. So that also has uh, more information. So the last two relate to more sufficient uh, information or more amount of information. The first two don't provide as much. And this is the driving simulator environment. If we want to look at this, this would, uh, I would look at this as the version 1.0, the environment that we had when I was at Purdue University to do the experiments. So this is also, uh, we have a driving wheel, you know, so they have the usual brakes and so on. But in addition to that, there is information that is provided in an auditory manner. And there is also a GPS system. So all of that has been synced in so that as a driver is going on the route, uh, this is the iPad here on which the driver can see where he or she is going. So, and then next to that, you have the BLR uh, uh, EEG system that uh, was present at uh, Purdue University and the basic for the EEG data that was collected there. So here, I want to, I'm going to illustrate that without the EEG being installed on the head, but I want to illustrate the actual experiment so that you can connect it to what I told earlier and what I'll be talking later. Okay, so. The driver is now driving on the route from the origin. 
to get information? Travel time to destination, by I-465, and at 69 seven minutes, by Alexandria Road, eight minutes. Travel time to destination, by I-465, and at 69 seven minutes, by Alexandria Road, eight minutes. So this is the location where the drivers can shift, and in this case, the participant is shifting. What do you see there is the work start time and the current time. So let me make pause here. And what you're seeing now is the participant is providing information on six or seven questions, which are the indicators that will measure that illustrate their feelings related to the information provided. Ready? I'll start. Yeah. And what that does is it uh, avoids memory biases because we have asked the participant to respond right after they provide that. Uh, they make the decision whether to stick to their current route or shift to an alternate route. So this is just uh, illustrating what's happening here. In terms of the participants, we had uh, for this part of the study, we had 84 participants uh, with valid information, and there were three runs that they did, each one about half an hour or so. So totally, the experiment was about two and a half hours. With you know, the reason part of the reason is we had to install the EEG, and that needs very precise tuning. So all of those, and there is the uh, trial runs to get them uh, uh, in many ways uh, familiar with what they're doing. And what you see here is that sample is skewed towards the younger adults. And part of that is not surprising because the, in this experiment, the participants are also required to wear an eye tracking device. So because they're aware, uh, it's difficult to have uh, glasses. The other one is uh, one of the limitations, uh, one of the issues with a driving simulator is the potential for motion sickness. And uh, older people have a uh, higher tendency for that. And the other thing is also we want to avoid any other disabilities or uh, uh, health related issues. Again, they are uh, more for older people. So it's very natural to see the population skewing towards the younger ones in this case. Okay. But the reason why we have 84 participants here, whereas the next study, which is again based on the same data, has about, I think, 92 or 95 participants, is because uh, we use people who are right-handed because dexterity affects the brain uh, activity as well. So if they're uh, right-handed or left-handed makes a difference, we use the right-handed participants here. And the physiological data that we collect is what you see there, what uh, on the brain there are uh, here 19 nodes, and then there are different regions which are associated with different uh, uh, tasks or activities or uh, outcomes. So the frontal region has the working memory and task plan and temporal one relates to auditory information processing. And we'll actually do in this study auditory information as you saw in the uh, previous slide. And there is the central parietal, uh, parietal region which uh, focuses on decision making and multimodal information processing. Multimodal relates to the modes of information. And then the occipital one which is related to visual information processing. And based on this, the signals that are obtained we can then uh, come up with uh, the band. So this is the, uh, you know, so we transition from that, the signals, and then we uh, come up with uh, uh, band powers. And these are isolated in four uh, frequencies here, four different uh, levels of frequencies. As you can see, there are lower ones, delta, theta, and the higher ones, alpha and beta out there. And this is where you get the data through the fast Fourier transform. The delta one is associated with increased attention to internal processing and memory retrieval. And this is important, and that's why I'm focusing on that. So increased delta implies increased attention to internal processing and memory retrieval. Increased theta implies increased task demand, which means they have to go into the internal processing and memory. And this is what comes when you're trying to interpret uh, real-time information or BMS message, and then put it in the context of uh, the current conditions you're facing related to your travel uh, objectives. That is, you're trying to get to a destination, you try to get it to the destination by a certain time, all of that. And the next one is the alpha uh, band. And here, you'll note that it reduces, so the bar band value is reduced with conscious effort or if you pay attention to external environment. And this typically would be done if you are having the intention to, uh, you know, Try to switch from the current route and so on. On the other hand, 
the beta waves are associated with uh, increased values. That means you have increased uh, arousal of your brain activity, and then you're focusing more on the external uh, side as well as the processing cognitively that you're doing. So these are the four that we have, and we'll actually link these to what's happening over there. So the first study here is associated with what I mentioned is providing real time auditory information. And the focus is on trying to obtain an understanding of the cognitive and psychological effects by measuring the physiological indicators uh, that uh, we, we just illustrated using the EEG. We're not going to be doing the route choice decision, which is the next part of this study. Okay. And then the EEG band powers that I mentioned, they have uh, they are looked at in four windows. Before we receive, or the, before the driver receives the information, so there's one location, location one, that information is provided. So, and then during uh, the time when information is being provided, we have noted that the information is provided twice. And then after they receive the information, there is a certain amount of time because that they make the uh, decision whether to switch or stay, and then they'll have the opportunity at a certain location to switch. So we have the baseline cognitive state, and then we have the information phase where cognitive effects are related to the uh, related to the information perception processing effect. And based on this, there are 76 models. There are 19 EEG nodes that are channels that I mentioned, four banks that are there. And based on that, there is a model form that uses the route. There are three runs, but we focus here, uh, at least in the results, I'll focus on route one. There are effects that are slightly different in routes two and three because of the time uh, constraints. I'm not going to talk about that, but you'll see that how the route, the run, the information, and the time, all of them, time window, all of them factor here. Okay, so the route and run are a combined indicator for the route and run and information scenario, the time window, and then finally, you know, whether the driver decides to switch or not. Okay, so. I skipped a slide here. I'm sorry. Go in the wrong direction. Just give me a second. Okay, there you go. All right. So there is some lag here that I'm trying to get past. Excuse me. All right. Uh, so here the results are illustrated in the four uh, time phases. That is the before, during, during, and after. And then there are three runs. We'll focus, as I mentioned uh, here, on route one. And there are the four types of information scenario, no information, current route, current and alternate and prescriptive information. And as you can see here, the lot the more intense the red is, it means there is increased activity there. The more blue it is, the decreased activity on the higher side. Okay. So the other thing you'll notice, which coefficients are significant. So if you see the uh, solid uh, circle there, it means that we are looking at a 99% confidence level. Whereas if you see this uh, hollow one, you'll see that that is at a 95% confidence level. And you'll see that that illustrates, uh, is illustrated out here. I won't be going into details uh, related to this. I want to focus on what we learned in terms of the results. The first one you'll note is related to the no information case. Since information is not provided, this links directly to the driving environment complexity itself. That is, when the driver is driving, whether on the freeway or on the arterial, near the location where the driver is trying to, uh, has the potential to get information and then beyond. So you'll see that those are the impacts that are being captured here. And you'll notice that uh, th these uh, task demands uh, are diminishing after their interactions with the road objects in a more complex environment. So what we are looking at is the arterial one. As I mentioned, the arterial environment is more complex because there are all these other intersections in the cross direction and there are uh, uh, exits and so on where people go here and there. So a lot of interactions, a lot, a lot more complex driving environment. So once they pass uh, the, uh, the road environment, uh, the location where they have to make a decision, then their uh, activity significantly reduces. So that is illustrated very clearly for the arterial context, whereas for the freeway, it doesn't make as, as much of a difference because relatively speaking, the freeway is a less complex environment. There are no artificial uh, locations where control will preclude uh, the vehicle from a vehicle to, uh, or will uh, lead to the vehicle actually stop. 
So it's more related to the traffic itself and the interactions depending on the level of condition. Then we look at the case where we have information provision, and that, that's what we see in the remaining three. And note that CT has lesser information, AT and PI have more information here. So what you see here is that there is a higher task demand in terms of processing information. Okay, and that makes sense because information in itself leads to the need for the traveler to process it in the context of uh, the decision making. So higher uh, band cross and increasing the time you, you'll note that, especially in the context of the arterial, because once the information is there, the information needs to be acted upon. So that then the surrounding environment becomes important, and then that is being reflected there. For uh, the freeway, as it's a less complex one, you'll note that it's there. Uh, it may be slightly higher, but not significantly uh, so. Uh, because of the presence of uh, that information. Then we look at information sufficiency. And here it's important for us to separate, separate the current uh, uh, travel time, current uh, route travel time versus the ones which have more information provided, which is the current and alternate, which is AT, and the prescriptive information. Okay. Here we see a clear uh, difference uh, in uh, relation to the arteria because in the arterial, we see a significant amount of red, and that's because insufficient information puts more onus on the driver to figure out what to do at that point. Uh, you see that also in the uh, context of the freeway, but not as much. Whereas when you see sufficient uh, information being provided, you'll see that both for the drivers uh, in freeway context and the arterial context, there is an increased uh, band powers there, which illustrates that there is the need to process and retrieve information. Then information amount, higher alertness and sensory intake. This is related now to the other two bands. Remember the alpha band and the beta band. So what you see here is the alertness and sensory intake to perceive and process information in a more complex environment. You'll see that that's why you see the more redness for arterial versus the uh, freeway. So there is slightly lower alpha band power. That's why you have more bluish or purplish this here under the more sufficient information or more amount of information that is uh, there. Whereas uh, there is higher level of driver distraction because of the amount of information that needs to be processed. So there is actually a trade-off that you will note here, that it is, which is in terms of the amount of information and the sufficiency of information. Okay, so what you'll see is that when you have uh, more uh, information that is provided, so when you have a recommended switch, there is higher psychological stress and anxiety, which is what is uh, shown uh, in the bottom part here. You see more red here, and this is especially true when you're having a switch to a more complex environment. Okay, so when you're switching from the freeway to arterial, you're moving from a less complex to a more complex environment, which is why it actually shows up in the context of the freeway, because this is where the information is being provided and the need for the decision related to the switch is being made. So in terms of insights, Cognitive effects of uh, route and information uh, of information depends on both the route and information characteristics. Processing real time information on a complex route requires more cognitive uh, uh, activity, and that uh, links to higher task demand related to internal processing and memory, and also memory retrieval, as well as how you process that memory. So that's what we mean by higher task demand. And if I have insufficient information, then uh, it leads to higher uh, task demand, which means you need to have more uh, ability to process and so on, because you're now dealing with higher levels of uncertainty in terms of the traffic condition. So, well, insufficient information leads to higher uh, task demand, so does the need to process a larger amount of information as well. So these are interesting trade-offs. That's what I was mentioning previously. 
So there are more cognitive efforts from the divers in a more especially in the more complex driving environment if you provide more amount of information. Though more amount of information may be better, there is that trade-off between that and insufficient information, but also between the amount of information and the level of complexity of the driving environment. So the route uh, recommendation to switch to a more complex route, that's why it leads to higher stress and anxiety. The next part relates to how we now use the cognitive uh, effects that we capture to make route choice decisions. And the way we do that is now we have driver attributes like age, driving experience, driver uh, attitudes related to information, trust, compliance, then the traffic congestion, trip purpose, these are situation factors, route characteristics, we use all of that. And we come up with the hybrid model. It's hybrid because it uses latent measures of states and information that can be directly measured. Okay. But we measure the latent states using the physiological indicators that we just saw. And in terms of the model, this is what we have. We have the physiological indicators, which are Y, and they allow us to infer on this latent effects. Those are the eta here that you see. Uh, so there is, uh, again, those are relationships, and then, of course, there are errors associated, so there'll be error term. Then, that's the measurement model. That's how we are measuring the, cycle, uh, the, physio uh, the psychological indicators there. And then uh, using EEG, so using the physiological data. Then we have structural model, which infers on the latent variables. And what it uses are these explanatory factors that we mentioned. And uh, also using this and, so using this cognitive effects uh, and the explanatory factors here. So both of these, the eta and the xi, we can now infer on the utility. And utility is the way we infer on the decision making of the individual, whether they say, hey, the current route has higher utility, I'll stick to the current route. The alternative route has higher utility, so I'll move a shift or switch to the alternative route. So this is the underlying model here, and this is where the route switch probability, whether it's switched to an alternative route, depends on your random utility of there, which is now a hybrid one, which consists of both the latent and directly measurable ones. So that's why the latent ones are shown in oval here. The observed, the directly observed ones are shown in the rectangle. So all the route choice is known, the physiological indicators, all the explanatory factors are available to us. Okay. All right. So here, as I mentioned, there are more participants because we don't need to have the dexterity issue that we needed for the other one. And we have the physiological data processing. So depending on whether you have personalized information or VMS information, uh, there are different stages here. There's always always the before information, the information phase, uh, then information is provided. And then the other one is the choice implementation, whether the whether the person decides to switch or not. So there are two time stages that we look at. And then there are four bands, four regions that I mentioned in the beginning. And we again track the change in the EEG power during the information phase and the choice implementation phase. And this allows us to uh, account partly for the uh, heterogeneity that's there across drivers, as well as because there are these differences that are systematic in terms of uh, roadway characteristics and traffic conditions. So the two elements here that we look at uh, are the cognitive effort, so the two latent effects, and what is the amount of effort that's put, and this uh, relates to increasing the beta band powers, so increased concentration, cognitive processing, and also increased psychological stress, and cognitive inattention, which is uh, during the implementation phase. So whether the uh, driver displays increased alertness to the external or attention towards the external environment or whether the driver is preparing for the stimuli that are up there. And then we look at the modal estimation results uh, related to this, where uh, these are the latent variables, then those are the other variables that physiological ones and other information. And we have how they affect uh, each other in terms of whether they're positive or negative effect, that's a plus or minus sign for the coefficient and so on. I won't go into the details in the interest of time, but I'll focus just on the insights that we get. So this, you have the various variables of interest, cognitive effort, cognitive inattention, and the utility there in terms of uh, how it contributes to that. But I'll be just going quickly to some of the uh, insights. 
what we notice is female drivers uh, exert more cognitive effort uh, to process and utilize the information. They may get more stressed under information or provision of both. So they may have more exertion or stress as well. So when they have personalized uh, auditory information, they exert less cognitive effort. And that's not surprising because when they have VMS information, they have to look out and they have to inter uh, interact with that outside and then have to come back to the within vehicle environment. So that's not surprising there. So drivers also spend more time to process and utilize information related to congestion because there's an accident that needs to be processed in terms of determining whether to stay out for the current or alternative route. And again, this as well, uh, if you have information that is not favorable to what the driver wants, because the driver is trying to reach certain location by a certain time, then that can lead to additional stress, uh, psychological stress for the driver. And in terms of the freeway, uh, driver spends more resources on the related to exits because on a freeway, if you note, know, there are only limited locations where they can exit and what are signs they need to see when the next exit is coming and so on. The other thing is drivers who are more uh, focused in terms of uh, processing information and utilizing it are the ones who are more likely to switch. And that's the reason why they do it. Again. So here information is provided with the intent to enable a switch. Okay, but I also talked about the, the effect. Switching routes requiring more information, so that requiring more cognitive effort as well. We saw that in the previous case as well. Whereas those who are who have less attention because they're not as bothered related to the road environment, that means they're not spend, expending the energy or the resources, uh, cognitive resources required to uh, you know start making a route switch. So they're less likely to do so. And drivers are more likely to switch if they receive information on uh, accident conditions downstream. If they're an arterial, which is a more complex environment, so they would shift to the freeway if possible. And if they receive uh, travel time information, and also very importantly, there is sufficient information that allows them to make a more informed decision. And in terms of the insights here, as you can see that the cognitive effort is affected by the characteristics of information. And this has key implications for the design and uh, information and design of the information font. Cognitive inattention uh, occurs with or without information, and that is affected by route characteristics as well. Again, there are implications both for the information service providers and for the designers of uh, the environment within the vehicle, but also designing how to provide external information as well. And here, the way information was provided related to providing information for the freeway or the arterial, not the detailed characteristics of these. So uh, the direct effects, that, you know, which typically have been studied in the past, were not, uh, you know, focused here. So it's not surprising that uh, we didn't, uh, you know, find much in terms of that, other than uh, effects related to gender in terms of what we discussed. So in terms of concluding comments, uh, we have uh, proposed a, a hybrid route choice model with two latent cognitive uh, effects that are there that allow us to have implications. More detailed implications that in the interest of time, I haven't specified here. For each of these, I could actually specify means in the context of the design uh, or what uh, uh, design of the uh, human machine interface or in terms of the uh, information content design, then how, what, and so on. Uh, if you're interested, we have papers related to them. We will be glad to share them. Okay. Estimated uh, cognitive effects demonstrate the importance, and this is the key, information systems, but also the need to monitor uh, drivers. How can we monitor them? Maybe through using cameras in the vehicle. If we can do that, that can potentially help with both improving the driver experience, but also allowing us to provide information that leads to lesser amount of distraction. And our experiment setup and design makes the proposed uh, model transferable, which means we'll use this uh, framework in such a way that you can use it elsewhere. Of course, you have to calibrate and validate it for the context in the real world that it's being addressed for. But in terms of the characteristics, all of these are uh, measurable in terms of what we have. Future directions, I mentioned that the sample population is biased towards younger drivers and 
you can avoid. Uh, so they have technology where eye tracking devices, for example, at Georgia Tech, they have non-intrusive one. So it, it sits on the dashboard and it can look at the eye and then infer. So you can that doesn't uh, affect people with glasses, but you can also deliberately make an attempt to focus on more older people as well. The panel effects, which means there are multiple runs, and uh, as you go across runs, there are things like uh, effect of familiarity and so on, but also fatigue and uh, effects there, there uh, you know, thereafter that can be important, but also, you know, situational factors like the amount of congestion or the purpose of making the trip, because if you're going to the airport versus going to a mall, there's a key difference in terms of the level of urgency you feel in terms of the decision making. In terms of the references, the first two that I showed here are what uh, we have in these two presentations. The first pres uh, part of the presentation is the first one, which is, uh, I guess, in some uh, stage of review. Uh, and the second one was accepted for publication part, uh, transportation research part F. As you'll note, uh, you know, all of them uh, have uh, Shubha Magarwal, who's my former PhD student, who just finished his dissertation at the end of last year. So these papers are all under review. There are two other papers, again, using uh, experiments. Sorry. Oops, I'm going in the wrong direction here. There you go. Uh, two other uh, papers here, which relate to uh, conditional automation when we have level three automation in terms of the ability of a traveler to take over when asked to do so by the automated system. I'll not, not be talking about that uh, here because of the time we have. But that's part of his dissertation as well. And so in terms of acknowledgements, I want to acknowledge uh, uh, him. Uh, and just as a, uh, you know, always uh, I find uh, interesting tidbits here. Uh, Shubham Magarwal is from Rajasthan. For those of you who are not aware, Rajasthan is the state in which uh, IIT Jodhpur is present. Uh, Shubham is from Jaipur. Okay. And then uh, Dr. Rina Benedict, who's another one of my PhD, former PhD students. And none of these, these are rather detailed and complex experiments. They do require a lot of uh, uh, involvement in terms of time, resources, but also effort. So I have to acknowledge my uh, members of uh, the research group at Purdue, some of whom are here today. And of course, some of them are at Georgia Tech with me right now as well, all of whom uh, contributed to conducting these experiments as well. And uh, this uh, study was funded by the US Department of Transportation Center for Connecting Automated Transportation, which is the US Department of Transportation's uh, UTC, for which I was previously the associate director and I moved to Georgia Tech after that. So, if you have questions or comments, I'll be happy to. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, thank you, Professor Pita, uh, for this informative presentation. Uh, I think, yeah, it just was too technical and many of transportation and people outside transportation domain, right? Uh, so they may be having uh, doubts uh, from their own perspective. So uh, first I would like to uh, to give over to Professor Shantanu Chaudhary, uh, who is our director, uh, IIT Jodhpur, and also the head of School of Artificial Intelligence and Data Science. And Professor Chaudhary, uh, over to you if you have any questions. Yeah, first of all, let me just thank Professor Peter for taking time out and uh, presenting such a wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, uh, in fact, the use of EEG for cognitive load analysis of the drivers and their attentional span and how the different situations impact their attentional span uh, is 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 a, is a very interesting work that you presented. I have a question that see we did some experiments at some point of time. Uh, whether we can provide some kind of a driver assist and driver alert while they are driving on Indian roads. That is some real time alerting system for the drivers. And we did some experiments and. Uh, in terms of using computer vision, as well as using not EEG, but ECG signal, and using EEG as a reference. Uh, so what is your comment on that? Uh, what kind of sensing and what kind of approach you think is desirable for auto driver alert system? Because actually Indian data says that on highway driving, 
a large number of accidents happens because of the drivers losing attention or just sleeping on the while driving and that actually causes not only loss of life but also since they're driving these uh, these commercial vehicles and commercial uh, uh, goods there is a loss of that uh, number of other persons as well as loss of uh, property so that's why this is this this driver alert system in real time operation is a very important requirement for indian roads so what is your opinion on that yeah so first uh, let me preface by saying that in a couple of the other studies that we did we do use uh, ecg and eye tracking data as well uh, even though i didn't present it here but i'll come back uh, i just wanted to mention that we do have uh, uh, work where we do that uh, uh, in addition to the EEG. Uh, coming back to uh, the question, which is a very important one, and I'm fully aware India, if, if you look statistically, has the number of highest number of uh, deaths per mile if you look at uh, the amount of travel that's made on the roads. And uh, the question uh, that you raised is very important because uh, what it relates to is uh, fatigue and uh, boredom, both of these can lead to inattention. So it can lead to either people being completely phased out with what's happening outside, or it can lead to people falling asleep, both of which have disastrous consequences. So here, the system that would, you know, uh, so what you mentioned about uh, the monitoring system, and then it's not just a monitoring system, but you also want that system to provide solutions so that the driver can be alerted. And some of this may be you know, the simplest one, of course, is one where there is a high decibel auditory uh, alert that's provided. And in some cases, it may be a haptic one, depending on the level of inattention. And so, uh, of course, there's an underlying assumption that we can actually have a system that can monitor the driver because uh, you can see fatigue. There are other studies that we have done, which have uh, you know, uh, which we have published, I think, about uh, 10 years ago or so where we looked at uh, the fatigue part of it itself and how we measure it using uh, devices inside the vehicle. Uh, th those have been published in uh, uh, journals related to IEEE and elsewhere. Uh, but the key point related to this is it may be a combination of haptic and auditory uh, uh, you know, cues that are provided. And especially at night time, it may also involve visual cues because of the need to look far downstream than people can see. So depending on the time of day, depending on the type of facility, the need can be different, but very clearly it may involve a combination of uh, haptic, which is uh, based on touch vibration, but there are new technologies, some of you know, one figure that I showed related to that. And there are uh, auditory as well as uh, visual cues that can be particularly important. Uh, you, you had mentioned about uh, you know, the auto steer and auto uh, tracking of lanes and so on. If those are, you know, those are providable, they may be capabilities that are within the vehicle itself. Whereas if you want a system which is developed as a modular system that can be placed within the vehicle after the fact, and that may be the case given where uh, we have, especially the freight uh, vehicles uh, in India right now, there may be systems that may be installed where you have the uh, you know, cameras in the vehicle and the monitoring system, as well as then linking it to the solutions in terms of the kits. Thank you. Thank you for your nice inputs. Again, thank you for taking time out and participating in this webinar series. Thanks to other uh, attendees. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Pita, for answering uh, this question. And uh, now I request uh, Professor Vadera. Professor Vadera, do you have any question? Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, of course, uh, an excellent talk. And uh, I don't know whether my question is relevant or not. You see, one is uh, Professor Pita is talking about fatigue. Reflexes also, reflexes are also one of the things. So, any relation between fatigue and reflexes, or how how do you look at? So, in in the context of this, so you talk about fatigue. Yeah, of course, fatigue affects reaction time. That's well uh, well known. 
uh, in the transportation demand that's been uh, studied. So that affects uh, reaction time of individuals. So the more fatigued you are, the higher your reaction time. So that makes a difference. Partly uh, also uh, if that is captured uh, in terms of the driver attributes uh, related to age, because with age reflexes reduce. The in the current experiments, we deliberately avoided that as control because we wanted to control for the variables that we were interested in. We wanted to make sure that people were not, uh, you know, fatigued and so on. So that was part of the requirement related to uh, the participants when they came in for the experiments. So can we conduct experiments related to fatigue and the uh, effect of fatigue? And uh, can we come up uh, with models related to that? Yes. And uh, th th there are uh, papers that we have had in the past where we had people drive, and this was in China. Uh, I think that uh, drove from, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember, maybe Nanjing to uh, Shanghai. And these uh, data were collected as people were driving in order to measure uh, fatigue. And part of how that was done was people were and this is the interesting thing, participants were required to stay away continuously for 24 hours or so, so or multiple hours. So, of course, there they could do that. I'm not sure we can do that here, but with my colleagues, uh, we actually did that. And based on that, we came up with uh, models, uh, uh, you know, of uh, related to uh, the role of fatigue uh, or how uh, we first we can measure fatigue and the role of fatigue in the decision making process. So, if you're interested, there are some papers related to that. I'd be glad to share. Yeah, what, why I was trying to say, perhaps in Indian context, it's not only fatigue, but reflexes are also because the way in which our driving is there, they also play quite important role. So, can I have a you know a contra view there? I actually consider Indian drivers to be really good in terms of their reflexes. They have to be, because the environment there is not as homogeneous as the environment yes. that we have in the US. So yeah. what you see there in terms of the reflexes, I think are honed over a period of time where they had to do that because the unexpected is something they have to expect much more often than here, right? So, there's, there's so in that sense, I, I would say it's more difficult out here if you have to have the same situation, so. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much, thank you. Thank you, Professor Badeda. Uh, uh, next, uh, Dr. Todeja, do you have any questions? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. First, uh, compliment to Professor Peter for the wonderful uh, lecture. And uh, you did mention in your presentation that your data is on the young adult, male and female both. But it will be interesting to know if some data are available either from your study or otherwise that which indicate the difference between male and female, young and old, old adult, and also the right-handed and left-handed drivers. And also if you have some data on uh, working and non-working population, and also the difference uh, within the family, you know, two brothers or brother and sister, and also some time frame data. So when you are driving, you see the morning or evening, if these informations, if I don't know if they are available, then it will help in the uh, appropriate real-time intervention what Professor Chetur, Professor Santanu Chaudhary was mentioning. Thank you. Okay, just to illustrate some of the, uh, you know, some of these are captured in the sense that we have, uh, you know, male and female clearly differences are there. I mentioned some of those. There are others that we have illustrated in the paper. Uh, in terms of uh, young and old, uh, you know, older, uh, the amount of data that we have, uh, as I mentioned, since it's skewed towards the younger population, it was not particularly useful. Of course, can we collect uh, data? And we have, at Purdue, when I was there, we deliberately made an attempt to do so. But what became a barrier there was the eye tracking technology, because many of them had uh, to wear glasses. So even though a lot of people had interest, they couldn't. And this is something we are deliberately making an attempt uh, in terms of, or consciously making an attempt to do so at Georgia Tech in our future set of experiments. And here we have a much bigger population, so that allows us to do that. Now, coming to the intent, even though, as I mentioned, we didn't talk about the trip purpose, which is okay, because we are first trying to isolate effects which are cognitive. We can add them 
and we can do those studies. But as I mentioned, when I was showing you the experiments, uh, the video for the experiments at Purdue, you would see, you know, the following information. You'll see 8 a.m., 820, and 818 or something were showing up on the screen. What it meant was somebody started at 8 o'clock, needed to get to their destination by 820. And they may or may not be able to do that, but they still had to do it using legal driving actions. What that means is they couldn't uh, run over other people or do any activity which was illegal from a driving perspective. That's the first. The second is it created the intent, which otherwise in a driving simulator versus the real world, you can miss. Because in the real world, if I'm going, as I mentioned, if I'm going to the airport, I have the real need to be there by a certain time. Otherwise, I may miss my flight. Okay, so that intent is there. So I'll display that intent in my actions. What we wanted to create is the ability to do so in a driving environment. And for that, we introduced a, a reward penalty system which the driver was or participant was not aware of. But what the participant was told was if they are able to reach their goals in time and if they do it using legal maneuvers, you know, they get more points. If they do it other way, you know, they don't. And then if they uh, do activities which are not uh, legal from a driving standpoint, the points uh, reduce. And based on that, at the end of the talk, you know, uh, their participation, they will get about 50 or $60 or at the other end, they'll probably get $10 maybe just for participation. So there's a clear uh, incentive for the participants out there. To a certain extent, that provided the intent. And in my view, that was important in the context of the experiments already. Can we include, uh, you know, the type of, uh, uh, you know, uh, work purpose? Yes, we can. So that would be another one that we can. And when we do that, we'll naturally see the impact of that. But my point is, we were able to capture the intent, which becomes important when you're looking at fundamental aspects related to the cognitive side. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tadeja. And other panelists, uh, Dr. Amitrati or Dr. Bhubendra, if you have any question. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Peter for such a informative uh, presentation. Actually, this is not my area, so it was also a new learning experience for me. So, uh, like, I had just one uh, query, some small query. Uh, Dr. Peter, uh, uh, does educational background also plays a part uh, in the in this process in on the driving behavior? In in the real world, it will, in the sense that if you use educational background as a proxy for uh, for the level of comfort with technology it should play a role. So in some ways, what I'm saying is educational background, people who are more educated uh, typically tend to be more savvy with uh, using technology as well. But the same thing can be said for really young people versus the older population, because the current generations are born with technology at a much higher level than people who are currently in their later years age. So, but having said that, Educational background can uh, play an important role, but as always, as people, a part of it also uh, relates to uh, income as well. Because if I have an uh, educational background as a proxy for income, then it means that we get into the question of equity or affordability, and lower income people may not be having access to it as much. So there is that angle that can be explored in there as well in terms of comfort. But as more and more, as we go to the future more and more, and some of these become the norm, then some of these effects will reduce the time related to the comfort with technology and the use of technology, because that becomes more the norm rather than the exception. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Peter, um, for your wonderful presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Bhubendra. Uh, Dr. Amitrati? you have any questions? Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Actually, I have a few queries. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much, Professor uh, Peter, for this wonderful presentation. It was again a new thing for me to learn. And thank you very much for introducing us to this particular field also. Uh, actually, the first thing I should ask is on slide number 42, you specified about certain uh, models, uh, which has some error functions as well as 
which was it was some latent uh, uh, modeling as a well structural some some. Let me go there. So yeah, maybe forty two, forty three. Whoops, it is going. No, it's, it? uh, it's lagging, so I had to press. Uh, let's see. Let's try to get to that a little more. So this is the, okay. Now it's going in the right direction. Okay. Alrighty. Is this the one? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I think so. Just no, just before the part two. Yeah. So, uh, no, just before one forty one, I believe. So, forty one. Yeah. Or, or are you talking about the model itself? That's an yeah, the model. Slide. Yeah. It, it, you, okay. Okay. That's in the concept. Okay. Yeah. Let me go to the model. Yeah. Yeah. So it's going to make it easier. Yeah. Go ahead. No, if, if you could Sorry. just explain a little bit more into that part, as a, like in a cute, uh, in a, this one maybe. Yeah. Interesting. Yes, this one. Yeah. So, so this is what, uh, if, if, if I had to put it in the context of uh, the past literature, in the context of the past literature, we would have the utility, which is a measure of the degree of satisfaction with different routes, right? Which route do I, you know, has what uh, degree of satisfaction for me? And the route with the highest degree of satisfaction is the route I'll pick, of course, in a, a random sense, because there are, uh, you know, unobserved characteristics that we don't account for, or a, un, unobserved variables that we don't account for. So this is random utility to start. With. That's why it's a probability. But given that, uh, if we know what that utility is, that would allow us to infer, in a probabilistic sense, the, you know, uh, the route, how much the, each route would have a probability in terms of that particular driver choosing it right and in the past that has been based only on the expression so if you look at u u is the b times the epsilon so the coefficients and the uh, you know the variables that are associated with the explanatory factors that are well studied route characteristics situational factors driver attributes and information characteristics right okay. so this is how Previously, it has been studied. And what we are saying is that assumes there is a seamless uh, processing of information by every driver, which is not true in the real world. It's not just because of the human characteristics alone. It's because that driver has to interact with the surrounding environment, which can be more complex or less complex that we don't know. So in reality, the use of information is much more than just what it is telling us about the traffic conditions in terms of the routes and so on. And in order to infer these unobservable or latent characteristics, this is where we have the cognitive or psychological effects, which are unobservable or latent, that we need to infer on. And this is where we use the uh, physiological indicators through the EEG to infer on these effects. And we do that by using a measurement model where Y are the physiological indicators that we measure, the EEG, and the eta are the cognitive effects that we postulate. And then we have a measurement equation that is saying that the physiological indicators, that is the EEG data that we get, is a consequence of actual cognitive effects that are taking place that we cannot measure directly. Okay, and once we do that, we come up with a structural model for these cognitive effects, okay, which uh, link to the explanatory variables themselves. So this is this part. And then what we say, and that's why it becomes a hybrid route choice model, because we use those that are latent and those that are directly measurable in terms of determining the utility. So in some sense, we are saying, what was assumed previously as being seamless, Plus, what is the reality in terms of cognition and psychology associated with information provision? Both are being factored into the random utility that is being determined for the individuals. Does that help? So, yeah. So, in both the in, in both the variables, uh, these are considered as random variables. Yes. So, these are random variables, right? I mean, they're random because uh, you know all of 
they have, if you look, all of these have error terms in them. Okay. In and, and the real world, these, these all the errors thing, are actually. Yeah. You can make statistically uh, denoted by normal distribution. Yeah, in this case, you know, there may, you know, there may be an assumption of a normal distribution because that's the most natural one in the real world. But this is something that you can uh, vary, and then depending on how you analyze your model, you can have you know different types of models out there. But conceptually, this is what has been done, which is different from the previous context. That's what okay. I want to emphasize. Any answer? Yeah, uh, um, I presume that this has been developed for the uh, uh, with respect to the US traffic, which is more homogeneous. Now, uh, if we consider as an Indian traffic, which is much more of heterogeneous, what do you think is mostly going to be changed a lot or which is a factor which is going to be uh, very sensitive enough? So what is going to change a lot? First, uh, my, uh, you know, of course, as I mentioned uh, earlier, I do believe Indian drivers are different because they are much more uh, you know, required to expect the unexpected compared to the drivers here. So that's a good starting point. But in terms of the differences, it again depends on the, uh, the situational factors. So if I'm talking about a free, uh, you know, a highway in India versus the surface streets, there'll be a lot of differences because the type of vehicles, you have a lot more uh, diverse set of vehicles in the Indian context, ranging from the slow to the high speed ones. That's one. The other thing, and this is something that I think I mentioned uh, starting from 2004 or five in the Indian context, which is the lack of lane discipline in many contexts because there are no lanes. So vehicles just occupy the space that they can. So these tend to be, uh, you know, factors that would affect the decision making. Now, what could potentially help in the Indian context is even if we don't have autonomous vehicles, because that may take a lot of time, if we can introduce this notion of connectivity in vehicles, which means we have vehicle to vehicle connectivity as a capability in vehicles or vehicle to infrastructure uh, connectivity, that would allow you know, the you know, fraction of a second or a, few, a second or two to have notice in advance so that people can anticipate. And when they can anticipate, their ability to, risk, uh, to react will be better, which means the reaction time can be low. So anything that can be done in the Indian context that can reduce the uh, reaction time by providing the critical, you know, sub-second or second or two for drivers can be particularly important. And I think that was the question that was asked at the beginning because in Indian context, we, uh, there are a lot of accidents that take place, and uh, many of these are avoidable. Some of them require regulatory and government uh, oversight in terms of uh, what is allowed, and then enforcement of those regulations in terms of the amount of time the freight drivers are allowed to drive before they have to take a mandatory stop, all that, but that requires enforcement. So in the absence of that, how can you leverage technology? And that is the question that we can address here by saying, okay, given that some of these are difficult and to put in place, can we leverage technology? And if so, how can we leverage the technology to uh, gain those uh, valuable, uh, you know, seconds or two seconds in there? That would be the focus of what I would be doing out there in addition to the driver monitoring, monitoring and uh, uh, response, you know, what solution we want to provide and how to provide even the ability for at least, say, the freight trucks to have vehicle to vehicle communication can be helpful. And here in the US, the vehicle to vehicle communication is one of the first uh, uh, implementers of connected vehicle technology. It's not surprising because they deal with profits, so any efficiencies they can gain and any gain related to, uh, you know, fuel efficiencies or safety efficiencies, all of those matter for them. So they're seeing that here, but even in the Indian context, the, the solutions that you want to look for relate to what you can control reasonably versus what you cannot control in the near term. In the long term, maybe yes, but in the near term, it's simply not controlled. So. Okay, okay. Thank you very much for this insight and uh, thank you very much.
Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Amit. And uh, Dr. Gita Krishnan is asking uh, whether too much cognitive effort, right? That is bad or not. Yes, it, and that is something that we observed. In fact, uh, that is one of the conclusions that uh, uh -huh. you know you will notice in here whether too much cognitive effort is bad, and that is why uh -huh. we have the practical significance for this study. The practical significance is that you know ideally we want to provide as much information as possible. The more information we provide the more cognitive effort is required. That's what I was mentioning as a trade-off between sufficiency of information versus the effort required for processing. They're going opposite directions sometimes. And the more information you provide, sometimes that can be distracting. So part of the design is related to the HMI itself. How do you design it? What type of cues do you provide? Under what situations do you provide which type of cues? All of these are questions that need to be studied. And that is one of the fundamental questions that going forward, whether it's in the Indian context, as Professor Chaudhary was mentioning, or in the US context, becomes important for a bunch or a range of stakeholders or stakeholder groups, not just the technology companies that are driving some of the innovation right now. We're talking about government agencies, transportation agencies, and we're also talking about, uh, you know, the vehicle manufacturers, information service providers, and all of these are different entities which have different objectives in terms of how they're interfacing with the travel market. Yeah, thank you. Professor Peter, in the interest of time, uh, I, I have just one question. Uh, so you have mentioned about the gap in research, right, in this area that addressing the cognitive and psychological states of driver while we are uh, traveling from this end route information to decision making stage right so in this cognitive and psychological state modeling okay uh, there, there will be some assumptions as you mentioned on human ability to process information so did you plan, did you made any such assumptions while uh, making you have this uh, driving uh, simulator or if such assumptions are there what are those assumptions in terms of like positive nature and negative nature like okay human can do these these things and human cannot do these these things so what are those assumptions positive or negative i can uh, say like that so and to be honest in this context there are no assumptions because that is the crux of our study we want to be able to infer on the cognitive or psychological effects so when we do this study, the idea is that we are creating scenarios. And so there are a lot of scenarios that are out there. Uh, again, if you're interested in that, we have papers related to those that are created. What we account for or what we isolate relate to what factors we want to focus on in terms of inferring on them. But then the whole idea of having a driving simulator environment is not requiring to make uh, assumptions on in terms of the ability or capability. We are postulating. In fact, uh, one of the earlier dissertations, which uh, will be out uh, you know, soon as well, focuses on the postulations that we make, that there are cognitive, there are psychological stresses, cognitive burden, uh, emotions associated with information, and those are not being factored right now into the decision making. What we do not consider relate to factors that I mentioned, uh, you know, in terms of uh, travel time, travel cost specifically, all of those things, which have been studied previously. And at this point, the experiment uh, setup where we are looking at a two route case, one which is involving the freeway and arteria. That's all we are looking at primarily to understand the role of the cognitive factors. So what we're isolating is not based on assumptions, it's based on the need okay. to control so that we can infer on the cognitive effects. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sapita. And now I uh, request Dr. Sadeja, uh, CEO, Jodhpur City uh, Innovation Cluster Foundation, uh, for uh, some for some words from his side. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Dr. Anjuman. As I said earlier, so this was a very interesting talk from Professor Srinivas, and it is uh, more in the context of Indian conditions, you know. In India, you see every year um, there, are, there are five lakh accidents, road accidents, and out of that, 150,000, 1.5 lakh people die. 
that is 400 people die every day in, on Indian roads. This is very important data which has been generated by Professor Srinivas. Now, you see, on behalf of Indian Institute of Technology, Jodhpur, and on behalf of Jodhpur City Knowledge and Innovation Foundation, I am pleased to present a small memento of appreciation to Professor Srinivas. Kindly accept it. Kindly. Oh, okay. And and you know this this small uh, memento has been prepared by the local artisans, craft artisans, and you should also know that you know these people are working very hard and playing very important role in the Indian economy, because you see uh, there are, there is total uh, export of uh, craft item from India is about twenty five thousand crore. And out of 25,000 crore, 8,000 crore export is from the Rajasthan state. And out of 8,000 from Rajasthan state, 2,000 crore export is from Jodhpur only. They are doing good job and playing a very important role in the Indian economy. And uh, once again, thank you very much, Professor Srinivas, for a wonderful and very exciting presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Actually, I'm sorry, but please, uh, really, I, I, I really like what I see there. And so on. just wanted to mention, I just remembered another point. When I was here with the U.S. Department on behalf of the U.S. Department of Transportation uh, related to uh, the Smart Cities Program of India, I was asked to focus on the city of Ajmer, again, which is from Rajasthan. So I just wanted to mention that I was in Jaipur and Rajasthan in, uh, and, and Ajmer, <laughs> focusing on the especially on the transportation and environmental aspects uh, related to smart cities in that context yeah. uh, and uh, uh, definitely look forward to future visits. Wonderful. 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 Thank you, Dr. Tadeja, for your kind words. And now I'd request uh, Dr. Manish uh, to have a vote of thanks for the session. So, so on behalf of Aid School, IIT Jodhpur, and JC Carrier, uh, we would like to thank uh, Professor Pita for spending his valuable time with us and sharing his idea on uh, on cognitive aspects uh, of real time information systems and their impacts on driver performance and decision making. We would uh, also like to thank our panelists, uh, Professor Chaudhary, Professor Vadera, Professor Toteja, and Professor. Uh, Amit Kumar Rati, Professor Bhupendra Singh, and Professor uh, Ranju Mohan for making this session interactive and having fruitful discussion. We would also like uh, to thank our attendees for giving their valuable time and attending the talk. We would also like to invite all of you to our talk of this series uh, by Professor Satish Fukusari on AI innovations in smart transportation for sustainable, sustainable and inclusive cities. Thank you so much all. Thank you. So yeah, specifically tell me. Oh, all right, great. Good seeing you, Ranjo. Okay. Yeah, thank you, okay. Professor Pita. Thank you for joining with us. Yeah, bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone.